So you asked about the advances from this meeting, and um, I would frame it first as the importance, given now the complexity and the multiple treatments available to patients and the imp enormous importance of the initial evaluation, that patients should really be seen soon after diagnosis at a center that has experience in bone marrow failure, and making the diagnosis, making recommendations, and applying uh, treatment. And that shouldn't wait until there are attempts, failures, uh, um, not appropriate treatments applied by physicians who just don't have experience in what are often for them rare diseases. So getting to the right center early is really important, and that's actually pretty easy uh, to do. And the APLASC and MDS Foundation is a great resource in terms of directing patients to centers that may be local to them or easy for them to access or even free uh, that, they can, uh, that they can go find doctors who have a, a strong interest and a lot of experience in aplastic anemia. In terms of the meeting, uh, the, I think there are multiple exciting uh, uh, results. Some of them are not yet ready for patients um, or for physicians in private practice or in, uh, the, in other centers to apply, but I think will, will be appropriate in a year or two. So in the non-transplant world, that's the application of this uh, drug already on the market, l, l trombopag that appears to be helpful when it's applied to patients uh, at first treatment with immunosuppression and even in rescuing patients who have failed all therapy, who are so-called refractory. Um, but we'll know more about that dr drug, I think, in a year, at which point uh, it should be, I hope, more available if the results um, uh, pan out, if they, uh, if they um, are borne out over time. For transplant, um, I think the important advances are that patients can now uh, be transplanted not only from siblings who are HLA matches, but from donor pools with high resolution, good genetic matches. Uh, and the results that have been reported from Europe and also from the United States suggest that the outcomes, especially in younger patients, are almost identical to those from uh, sibling transplants. And that's a very important advance. For, for the transplant donors, it's actually a worldwide registry. The registry in the United States is huge, but we've, uh, we've been able to facilitate uh, unrelated transplants from donor banks all over the world, Europe, China, and elsewhere. Um, so there are now millions of people are in the registry. And uh, the prospects, for, for example, for Caucasians are excellent that they can find a, uh, a good donor. And putting that together, the hope is that we'll be able to speed the whole process up so that patients get definitive treatment as quickly as possible. So an ideal scenario would be a patient who doesn't have a donor immediately will have a go at uh, immunosuppression with a drug that stimulates the stem cells in two or three months. There'll either be evidence of a good response or not, and then that patient can move on rapidly to a less conventional transplant with a higher prospect of that being life-saving. If our current immunosuppressive trials um, hold up and that we really do have drugs that can now uh, help the bone marrow work, especially if they are used early on in the disease when there's still stem cells and we're now suppressing the immune system that's damaging the stem cells, then the prospects for non-transplant therapy in those patients who can't go to transplant are, are going to improve. And uh, that may make for uh, response rates that are substantially higher than the ones that we have now, which are not bad. Two-thirds of patients will respond to current treatment, but I think that they can be improved. We'll get a faster answer as to whether a patient can uh, be benefited by this treatment, and we'll have a faster route to transplants that are more high risk or less conventional, like using alternative donors. On the research side, I think it'll take a year or two, but there, we will have better predictors and I think a better idea of which patients do poorly long term and really will, for example, benefit from a transplant done early. Those patients who are more likely to evolve and conversely those patients who are more likely to uh, improve and remain stable and uh, actually be cured of their aplastinemia without a transplant. So that's going to be the application of genomics. So there are multiple reports, uh, including from uh, NIH, of uh, the molecular basis for this conversion of aplastic anemia to MDS AML that occurs in a minority of patients. And I think that that will have good information that will be helpful to the patient within a couple of years. And yeah, it's, uh, it is a blurred line. Um, so the pediatricians, uh, like Akiko C, patients, young uh, kids generally, who have, uh, I think, fairly clear-cut 
congenital syndromes. They've been born with it, they often have physical anomalies as a clear family history. And so the, the view from the point of view of pediatrics is that these are well-defined syndromes that occur usually in the first decade of life. And what we're seeing in the adult world is patients who have similar, not usually identical, but similar mutations to uh, the ones that are recognized in the pediatric uh, clinics. But these really represent risk factors and not determinants of disease. And by that I mean that um, the, the, a family may have multiple members who have uh, exactly the same mutation, one of whom will have aplastic anemia, but others are well, and they remain well. They'll be fine until something else happens to them. They have normal lifespans as far as we can tell. Or they will suffer, as in the example of the telomere diseases, they'll suffer disease in other organs, uh, like the liver or the lung, which we're now much more aware of. Again, the the manifestations and the prognosis being highly variable. So one individual, same mutation, can have severe cirrhosis, and another individual, same mutation in the same family, can have very mild liver function abnormalities that never progress. So these are risk factors, and they don't mean that you're going to get the disease, uh, but it's really important to identify uh, families for genetic counseling, um, for differences in the way uh, the treatment should be applied. But there is an overlap, and it is gray in the sense that patients with risk factors, for example, uh, that are based on telomere biology, can respond to immunosuppressive treatment. Patients can be transplanted uh, without high risk if the, uh, if the disease is recognized and the uh, transplant is modified accordingly. Um, so they're not as separate as we used to think, where the pediatricians had just the genetic problems and the adult uh, hematologists just saw the immune-mediated uh, aplastic anemia. There is a really gray area, and an area I think of real of overlap of pathophysiology. The Aplastic Anemia MDS Foundation is an excellent resource uh, for exactly that. Uh, so I think that uh, the website, uh, the people in the foundation are very useful, very helpful in recommending either local to the patient or uh, nationally uh, places that they can go see physicians, see groups that have a cumulative large experience in making the, di making the right diagnosis and uh, in providing treatment or making recommendations for treatment. And I think that um, I'm, I think there are very few excuses now for patients and for physicians for that matter, uh, waiting at home for months and months, trying remedies that are not known to work or hoping that things will get better when you can just hop on an airplane uh, in most cases and get to a center where at least you can get good advice and may even be able to get uh, the right treatment.